Um, so it's a 15-pin interface card for the two 2 Plus, two ENGS. It has an HDMI video connector, which is uh, connected to the TV over here. It generates HDTV 1080p, so two megapixels, 1920 by 1080 uh, video. And it um, displays all the first, second, and third generation video modes uh, on any of, of the Apple II line. And uh, I'll give you a quick tour of what that means of a few generations here. So the first one was 7 megahertz clock. That was the Apple II and II Plus, um, and the, the clones. And it had 40 column text, uh, the 16 color low res, 280 uh, high res. There's also a 14 megahertz shift that gave you the extra, extra two colors. And the mixed mode with the four text rows below the graphics. And all the modes have uh, two pages for page flipping. Second generation, the clock went from 7 megahertz to a 14 megahertz pixel clock. Uh, and that was the 2E, 2C, and Laser 128. And um, the 2E, of course, generated all the 7 megahertz modes, but they added lowercase and mouse text characters to 40 columns, uh, added inverse lowercase and mouse text 80 column, uh, lo double low res. There's also this kind of little known four color mode in high res that the 2E added, where if an NCD of 3 is on, but you're in 40 column mode, then um, the high bit is ignored in every graphics byte, which can be useful for uh, storing collision data or uh, slightly optimizing drop code or whatever, so that the top bit is a don't care. Uh, there's also the uh, monochrome double high res and the color double high res, 16 colors. Um, still all with mixed mode support and all with page flipping. So we've got 7 megahertz and 14 megahertz pixel clocks. Then the third gen was the GS, and that was 16 megahertz designed for analog RGB monitors. Um, the GS emulates 7 megahertz and 14 megahertz 2E modes, uh, but as RGB, plus the 320-200 16 color with fill, the 16 megahertz 640-200 16 color palettes, uh, the 3200 color race the beam, uh, kind of synthetic mode, um, monochrome for uh, double high res, uh, and also for NTSC, but not for RGB, ironically. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a monochrome mode for all of, of NTSC. Uh, it also added 16 color palette for border color, text color, text background, eight international fonts, 1560 hertz selectable video timing, which the other machines didn't have, uh, a horizontal vertical, vertical counter register, so you can see where the beam is as it flies across the screen <coughs> as the two GS generates its video. Also, H plane can be blank interrupts, and a two and a half megahertz fast read mode for shadow frame buffers. Um, mm -hmm. And then, kind of critically, the GS generated its NTSC and PAL by taking its 16 megahertz RGB and encoding it through a separate encoder chip. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, so the VidHD card does all of these three generations uh, on any Apple II. So, uh, 1977 Apple II can do super high res or double high res, and some other interesting things that come down from this. Um, so, so, there were some problems with the GS's third generation uh, graphics implementation. Um, Crew touched on some of these in his talk. Uh, so one is that the light blue color from uh, high res is emulated as a dark blue, which is really noticeable and messes up a lot of the, of the uh, you know, 8-bit game graphics. Um, and there's a bunch of bugs on the 26K motherboard. Page 2 is broken, so page flipping doesn't work in a lot of the modes, um, largely the graphics and text modes. And then, uh, Monochrome double high res didn't work properly. And of course, monochrome mode is NTSC only, doesn't work in RGB. And, um, and then because the high res graphics and double high res graphics were converted to an RGB and then sent through a conversion chip to make NTSC at the end of the day, they lost the NTSC desert colors and artifact colors that gave the Apple II graphics a lot of their look and character. Anyway, and then, uh, so the result of this is that the badly emanated colors and the page two bugs also show up on NTSC. So NTSC isn't very useful on a GS, generally. All right, so um, the VidHD project has been put together in about the last year. Uh, it's from my company, BlueShift. Uh, we're an uh, engineering firm founded in 95, where we basically do consulting engineering and co-development. And we have electrical engineers and software engineers, which is somewhat unusual. Uh, we do a lot of embedded development and graphics engines and helping ship assist for teams get over the hump, and mostly console desktop and 
uh, some consumer and a little bit of mobile. Uh, VidHD was designed by Doug Snyder. He's a uh, longtime hardware engineer, worked at Atari back in the day uh, on the Quinup hardware for Millipede and Space Duel and Tetris and a bunch of these games. And then uh, I started on the Apple II. I'm mostly an embedded developer and graphics engine uh, architect. And so uh, we thought, hey, let's use all the new cool tech and make a video card for 1080p for the Apple II. How hard could that be? <laughs> so uh, our goals were to um, be able to do all the different Apple II video modes on HDMI TVs. They're pretty inexpensive now, about $100. And they look great, so that's cool. Uh, and uh, we wanted to add the second and third gen modes back to the first gen system, uh, systems. And we were trying to limit the engineering scope by doing the bulk of the development in software rather than hardware. Uh, we have two, two system on chip processors on the card. We have an Apple Bridge chip whose job is to, uh, is to watch everything the CPU does on the Apple II bus and take notes. So every write to uh, video memory and every change of a graphics mode or a bank swap, it basically records all that stuff and sends up to the video chip so the video chip can generate the video on the HDMI display. And, you know, for the retro community, it needed to be reasonably affordable or just it was going to be an uh, interesting project that, you know, no one could afford if it was a super crazy thing. So, um, so the main effort really was the graphics engine. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's this graphics engine, most graphics engines run at 60 frames a second. Uh, here, this game is being played by the Apple II CPU on the bus at a megahertz, which sounds slow. Uh, but a graphics engine running at a million frames a second uh, turned out to not be so easy. Um, so we have 980 nanoseconds for every update that has to be processed. Uh, we have an 800 megahertz 64-bit ARM. So we have 800 cycles for every one of those Apple II bus cycles. And in, that, in every cycle, we need to draw 160 pixels at our super high resolution. So we get about uh, six cycles uh, per 1080p pixel to figure out how to do um, you know, whatever mode we're in and to anti-alias uh, the 7 and 14 megahertz modes and all kinds of other fun stuff. Um, so the major challenges were just getting the CPU code fast enough and then getting the bus fast enough because um, with only 800 cycles, if you miss caches or stalls of any kind, um, then you're going to not be able to authentically replicate what the, uh, the Apple II is trying to do. Uh, so yeah, um, let's do some demos. Sorry, what was that? Um, this one? Yeah, I, I can't really lift it. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, this is about as high as I can go, and these are they're on the table, so I can't do much about it. I'm afraid. Okay, so here's, here's Wavy Navy, and we're using uh, the TUI uh, color set here. So if you look at the two, 2GS mo uh, monitors, both the RGB and the composite output have the, the GS's third generation emulation of high res, which has very deep blues and um, doesn't have the, the correct uh, NTSC artifacting. Now, so one of the things we can do is pause the game and go into a control panel where it knows what machine we're on and there's a lot of choices of what we can do. One of the things we can do is say we want the, the GS color scheme instead of the Tweed color scheme. Um, or we can go back to NTSC and we get color fringing and kind of blurry graphics. And then we also have a optimized mode which we call HDTV which um, removes a lot of the, the ringing noise and Kind of undesirable artifacts of uh, NTSC. And so this is the sharpened version, and here's the blurry version. It's probably hard to see from the distance you're at, but up close it's definitely uh, a, no a noticeable difference. And it's kind of a, probably a personal preference what people like. Um, so, like the GS, we can set uh, background colors, we can set uh, border colors. Um, so, like on a, on a 2E, we just go black. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, we also have all the fonts. So the eight 
the fonts for the international languages would be available on the uh, Tune 2E. Yes, Sarah? How does it do, uh, how does the Katie column mode look? Because a, oh, sure. a lot of the cards that are out there right now, when it does 80 columns, some of the, some of the text. Yeah, will wobble. Well, that's the nice thing about generating it with a, a digital display is you don't have that. <laughs> And the analog sampling, trying to figure out where the pixel is. The pixels are discrete and they're known because uh, they're being generated uh, you know, 1,920 of them across the screen and sent to, through HDMI digitally. So, um, but yeah, I can do hit a column here. And you know, we can leave, leave it up or I can do demos later so you guys can see it in, in more detail. Um, but one of the uh, kind of poster childs for that is. Um, is GSOS. So it's a little hard to see in this monitor, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but it's, it's stable, it doesn't have the, the noise effect that is typical. It's as sharp as it gets. Right, so it's, it's just interleaving the, the columns, which is kind of what the, the GS uh, desktop likes to do. Um, and Sure. So the audio will output to the monitor as well. Well, yeah, if you have like a receiver, you can, you can uh, like most receivers, will have a video in and an audio in, and you can pick which ones you want to use and send it, you know, send it to your speaker however you want. So, yeah, you can, you can totally do that. Oh, I think he wants to go to the HDMI port. Right, again, a, a, an HDMI receiver will, will do that. So you can say, I want the audio input to come from a three and a half inch jack and the video to come from input number two or whatever, and then send the output to the television. So, but yeah, we don't output audio through the HDMI, you know, we're, we're doing video only at this point. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. Um, we can also, so because we're emulating kind of the beam as it scans across the screen, you know, moving, you know, changing position many times a second, um, all of the race the beam demos or stuff you know work kind of as expected. Um, so you know the French Touch has lots of interesting tech demos which kind of race. So anyway, um, this is kind of just different examples of you know, cycle accurate um, emulation, really, of both the Apple II video generation and the NTSC interpretation of that NTSC signal by uh, an old CRT monitor. Um, I've got four uh, Apple RGB monitors, uh, three of which don't no longer work. Uh, I'm, so I'm basically one monitor away from not having any monitors that work. And it seems like all the CRTs are kind of in that boat. So just like the uh, you know, getting access to USB storage has really, I think, boosted the use of the Apple II across the community, um, you know, we figured if we can uh, help solve the, the, the output video problem, that would also be of use. Just, I'm sorry, I realized since we hooked this up that this HDMI input is mm -hmm. not in game mode. Ah. So if anybody sees latency there, it's largely because my TV is doing processing. So you would, you would want your, your modern TV to be set in game yeah, just to repeat that, um, one of the things with, uh, with the modern 1080p TVs is that they can uh, try to blend across multiple frames to smooth things out and make it look better for, for movies. 
uh, and they pretty much all have a game mode for game systems, and that's really kind of the, the mode to use uh, for this card. Um, so a few other demos here. Um, so here's uh, 32 on a color mode where it's you know racing the beam, changing palette colors. Uh, see, they're all, these are the, the two discs I released in uh, 88 and 89. Um, but these are some of my torture tests just to make sure that you know, if the beam and the graphics ever get desynced, the colors all go haywire. So the French touch demos and the, the 3200 color picture demos are, are good um, you know, torture tests for anyone messing with uh, you know, Apple II compatibility, or GS compatibility specifically. Um, let's see. Oh, and then uh, yeah, the other, th I guess, thing, thing to note is that uh, just like having your TV in game mode is important, uh, it's also a good idea to have a, uh, a good power supply because it is a, you know, it's a, kind of a modern CPU. It's an 800 megahertz uh, processor. We have two chips on board. Uh, I haven't had any problems yet, but I'm also running a Reactive Micro, you know, upgraded uh, power supply here. I've tested on lots of Apple unupgraded power supplies, but um, just like the CRT monitor analog uh, circuitry is not aging well, uh, power supplies also are known to not age super well. So uh, that's maybe a good idea to upgrade to if, uh, if you like. Um, let's see, other demos real quick. Let's try it again. Um, um. So the other thing that's that's interesting because we're generating our own video, is this demo uh, does page flipping. <coughs> and on a GS, it disables the low, the text at the bottom. And the reason that's disabled is because page two, again, is broken on the GS. And so the page flipping shows the text on one, on page one, and it shows garbage on page two on the RGB and the CRT uh, monitors. But because our card is watching everything the processor is doing, when we see writes into page two, we go, well, we'll pretend that's for us, even though the hardware wouldn't normally work that way. And so we get kind of correct, page one and page two, page flipping. Uh, now, that only works at one megahertz, because above one megahertz, not all the data shows up on the bus. It's in its kind of fast mode. But most of this page flipping stuff was two and two E games that were wanting to use both pages and do page flipping. So that's another case of being able to kind of fix some of the problems. So we of, of the particularly the third gen. So we have, uh, we kind of have the fixed monochrome double high res. Uh, we have the fixed um, page two text and double low res and, and low res. Um, and we have restored the NTSC uh, kind of behavior. Um, yeah, so kind of lots of good things can happen once you kind of take over the video side because the Apple II design is kind of a video system and then a CPU as well. Um, but the, the video was kind of the, the core memory refresh, memory access, you know, machinery. So let's see, um, other interesting demos. Let's see. So, um, so because, um, because we have a higher res screen and the Apple II does have a notion of um, varying text resolutions. Like that's kind of been in, in, in the monitor firmware from the earliest days of the Apple II. We can, uh, we can extend the text modes. So here is a text mode that has 80 wide, but it's 80 characters filling the whole 1920, and then it's 45 tall. So I'm, I'm just mirroring the, the text video here so you can see how much extra space you would have. Um, So this is 120 wide by 67. So you effectively get like six pages worth of text. And then if you have a big screen TV and you're sitting pretty close to it, you can do this mode. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, 240 wide by um, 135 rows. So uh, yeah, so, so you can do cool things. All right, um, so 
let me go back to slide land. Let's see how we're doing. All right. Um, yeah, so the next steps, uh, we're targeting uh, production in October of 2018. Uh, we're targeting a price of 129 per board. Um, it is somewhat dependent on how much interest there is. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if it's three, it's different than, yeah. So, um, yeah, right. so, so we've got a, a we're, we're opening a, uh, an order waiting list. So if you want to reserve uh, a board, tell us that you're interested, whatever. Um, so there's an email address and uh, include the number of boards you would like and then we can figure out how to produce this thing uh, for real and get it into people's hands. Nice. Um, so questions? Yeah, Digging? The monochrome mode, can you colorize the monochrome? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So the question was, can you colorize monochrome? Um, yes, you can. So we can go into uh, monochrome and then um, you can, oh, let's not change the background color. Actually, let's not change all those colors. Um, so if you, if you like the light green look, or just white. Also notice there's a scan lines. Oh yeah, that's another, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, oops. so let me pause this so it's easier to see. So we can say we can say that there's no visible scan lines. So this is just solid uh, lines from top to bottom. Or we can uh, make them dark, so that you can get separations between the lines. You know, or you can make it more subtle, so just kind of a, a mild hint of where the lines are. Um, I always liked the CRT spacing because I could like kind of count uh, lines and times and stuff that way. But um, yeah, we have some preferences there for different aesthetic choices. And more questions? Is there a way to output 2 GS graphics on 2D or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, the card uh, will do double high res on an Apple II Plus. It'll do super high res on an Apple II Plus. Now, the memory isn't there, so you, it would have to only be like a slideshow that just loaded stuff and store to oblivion because there's no RAM to store into. Uh, but the card will say, yes, if you say you're swapping Augs memory, I will trust you. And your next rise, I will believe you're going to some mystical Augs memory. Because uh, on, on, you know, on the video card, it's got main memory and Augs memory of its own, and it's keep, keeping its own you know, notes of what's going on. So it doesn't actually have to be memory as far as it's concerned. Um, Sean, you had a question? What was that? Um, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. So, uh, it, technically, that should be possible, but it would be a bunch of engineering work, you know, to, to figure out how to do that. So, that's, that's one of the things we're we're kind of trying to figure out is, uh, you know, is it worth doing the extra work to be able to do more changes in the future? Or, and, and I think some of it's going to depend on the interest list. You know, if if, if this is a, a bigger product that's going to have a bigger lifespan, then we probably will go through the effort of making it upgradable. Um, if this is more of a one-time thing for you know a few people, then you know, we'll probably just say it's fixed as is. Okay. Yes. Um, is there, I've looked at this and thought I'm thinking of the uh, video overlay card, which mm -hmm. you can put in the two, and also also GS and graphics. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it can also digitize. The graphics. Yeah. Um, not really. Uh, yeah, again, the hard, hardware-wise, modern hardware can do all kinds of things. It's all software. Uh, that's the, the, you know, the pro and the con of, of these, uh, these chips is, you know, they've got programmable FPGAs and they've got, you know, multiple cores. And so, yeah, we could, we could do a lot with it, but it's really just a question of how much time and effort does it make sense to, to spend on it. Uh, we, we're not intending to emulate the video overlay card itself because there just weren't very many apps for it. And it was kind of a, it was kind of shoehorned into a difficult place. So I'm not really sure that it's all that uh, good of a design to try to emulate. Yeah, Charles. What doesn't work? And like, what are? It, it looks like you can do every kind of combination and permutation of video modes throughout those three generations that you mentioned. Right. Is there anything that says, oh well, this doesn't work? 
Um, so the, the, the two, so I, I have three things that I'm, uh, that I'm working on before I would consider it kind of ready to, to produce. Um, so one is the startup time. Because it's a big modern chip, when you turn it on, it isn't ready to go right away. It has to kind of boot up and get prepared. It takes about 25 seconds. Uh, so I, I want to streamline that and get it down to hopefully around 10 seconds. It's still longer than immediate, but, you, but even, even those CRT monitors, you, know, you turn them on and then it's not right, right away. Yeah, it's, it's uh, wait for it to warm up. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's one thing that I would characterize as we're not as good as we would like to be and kind of arguably not as good as a CRT with its instant on. Um, and then um, let's see, uh, another one is, is that we are, um, we are emulating the, the raster uh, of the video generation of an Apple II. So basically a million times a second, the beam is flying around. But that doesn't really sync up with the HDMI. So we, HDMI is a, a negotiation between what the monitor can do and what the computer that's generating the video wants to do. And so some monitors run at 100 frames, 120 frames a second, some run at 50, some run at 60. They're different, they're different speeds, right? So there's, uh, so a game that runs at 60 hertz on the Apple II may still catch the beam. There, might, there could still be a tear occasionally um, because what the speed at which the HDMI is outputting pixels, it may not see the part of the frame buffer that the, the Apple II is drawing in at exactly the same moment the Apple II is drawing it. Whereas the CRT, you know, the CRT is displaying at the instant basically that the Apple II is generating. So there's a little bit of a disconnect in timing between the HD, HDMI display and what the Apple II thinks it's doing. Um, so we have about a uh, about a 32 micro, uh, microsecond delay between when the Apple II draws a pixel and when we get the 160 uh, 1080p pixels that correspond to that into our frame buffer. But when the HDMI signal actually takes that part of the frame buffer and gets it to the screen, you know, it's somewhat indeterminate. Right? There's, there's, a different, there's an additional interaction there. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's not quite the same. But anyway, and it, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, again, this question mark of should we try to make it field upgradable and do all the complexities that come with you know how to do that? Yes. Uh, two, two sound-related questions to kind of dovetail what Herb was asking. Um, since you are sending the signal through the HDMI, and since you're gathering the data from the actual bus, mm -hmm. how difficult would it be for you to look at the two bits that are used for the set out and for the speaker out, and then to bring those into your stream? No speaker. The yeah. Um, yeah. So the the the, the so trying to look at trying to tr trying to electrically look at what the speaker is doing on the motherboard is probably tricky because um, then you have to get an A to D converter and or mess around or you basically have to sample the speaker. I mean, probably what I would I would be inclined more to just watch when CO three O is hit and then try to you know emulate the behavior. But even that is not so simple. I mean, there's all kinds of subcarriers and craziness. Um, so yeah. So it, again, that's technically doable. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's worth it. Uh, it's probably easier just to pull the pull the audio off the speaker. Well, so that would be the, the second question to it, and I'm done asking questions. So, with, like with a mocking board, or just turning around and sending it, out, turning it up around and sending the speaker out, or the cassette out back into your board and then sending it to the HDMI. How engineering wise, how tough would it be? Well, I don't, I don't know. Again, we don't have an input for that audio, so, um, so yeah, that's that would be a hardware problem. And then, in addition, you have to figure out the the, the software machinery of how to process that input, that audio input in a way to generate the correct sounding output. So I, I, I think that's probably technically doable, but that's another, another rabbit hole. Are we out of time? Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, John.